one. Get out your notes. Get out your vocab. I hurt my ankle for you. Day two, we're talking about the battles and events of World War One, and we will actually get to a resolution, a wrap up of the war. We're gonna, we're gonna fight the whole war today. We're gonna fight the whole day two of two. We're gonna fight the whole world war today. So let's um, right domino, bam, 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 bam. All of a sudden, all of Europe is at war with each other for main long term reasons and one immediate cause. So the immediate cause was the assassination. What were the four longer term reasons? What's the M? The M. Uh, militarism. Militarism. Militarism, right? Wanting to have a big army. What was the A? Alliances. Excellent. Somebody but JR. What was the I? Thank you, somebody but JR. Appreciate that. Hey, magic rain has fallen. That means you're doing good. Okay, so I got I gotta silence you. And then what was the end? Nationalism. Nationalism, which sometimes is patriotism, and that's good. Sometimes is extreme, and it says, I want to kill you because you're not a part of my country. That is bad. A little bit more about the trenches. This is obviously a sketch. So, like I said, the first time I said it, maybe you thought they just dug a hole in the ground, right? Well, look at this sketch. The more time they had to build it, the better they could make their trenches. Now, the first thing you would want the trench to be taller than you. Right, because you want the bullets to whiz over your head while you are safe inside the trenches. So the first thing is that the trench had to be taller than a man, okay, six, seven feet tall. So how do I get up and actually shoot? Well, I got to have a little step. I'll click back a few here, and these guys, these guys are looking over the trenches, right? They're taller than the trench so that they can shoot. That's because there's a little bit of a step here. Uh, and then again, the more time you got to build, you got your little shelf. Your elbow rest, a little bit of a backstop here with your sandbags. And then when it came time to nap, you know, you've got a little rest. When you got time to rest, there's even a dugout. That's called going over the top. If you have to come out of your trenches, you're going over the top. And a lot of times they'd be signaled with a whistle. We have some new technology like field telephones, but sometimes just your trusty old whistle is how they would stay coordinated. If one man went over the top by himself, Right, sniper shot, he go down. But if a thousand men went all at the same time, yeah, there's likelihood some of them would get shot at, shot down. But a thousand men and then two thousand men all going at the same time, that's how they that's how they try to take over the enemy trenches. But like I said, even across two and a half, three years of fighting, very little change would make. But this is actually a replica whistle of what they would have used. You heard me blow it when I came into class and flopped on the floor like this field artillery. This is a, it's not like your average referee's whistle. If you go to a basketball game, you get a referee blow his whistle. It's not going to sound like this. It's got a really unique sound, and it's because it's made of the tin and then the shape of it. So I'm going to blow it one more time. And I want you to imagine this whistle, and then the sergeant says, follow me. And a thousand people follow him trying to attack the enemy. So it'll be like this. Over the top, boys! Over the top! Follow me! And that's how they would attack. We talked about feet. When you get your feet wet and nasty, it's actually, it's called trench foot. And it was such a big deal. Like, have you ever had your feet checked? Maybe you, you went for a run, you play a long basketball game, softball game, and your feet get sweaty, grimy, in that soccer game. Feet get sweaty, and grimy. No, that's after like one hour. Imagine being in the trenches for that long. So, it was actually a really big problem. Soldiers straight up became a casualty because their feet would get dirty and infected. This is a doctor checking on his soldiers, right? A medic checking on the soldiers, making sure their feet are dry and good. Because if you don't take care of your feet, y'all, these guys aren't any wimp wimp. These aren't these guys aren't weeds. They their feet are so hurt that they can't put any pressure on them to walk themselves to the support trenches or to the reserve trenches. They have to get a piggyback right to do that. That's how bad trench foot was. Now, I'm going to show a picture that's kind of gnarly. You don't have to look at it if you don't want to. This is real deal trench foot. This is what would happen when you're in the trenches full of water for three, four, five, six, seven days. Keep your feet dry. Keep your feet clean because that is literally rotting flesh. Right. Here's a quote for you, hopefully just to illustrate what life was like at Verdun. 
this young French lieutenant, he wrote this in his diary, his journal. So when something's written in a journal, what type of source is that? First person. First person, but what was, what's the Primary label? Primary source. Primary source, right? We can trust it because it was someone that was there. He gives a first-hand perspective. This young man, he died. He died uh, by artillery uh, eventually, but he was alive to write this in his diary. He wrote, humanity is mad. It must be mad to do what it is doing. What a massacre. What scenes of horror and carnage. I cannot find words to translate my impressions. Hell cannot be so terrible. Men are mad. What did General William Tecumseh Sherman say about war? War is, war war is hell. And this lieutenant, he writes, hell cannot be this terrible. Men are mad. Why are we doing this to each other? What motivates human beings to fight each other like this? That was his impression. So that is what he was living through in the trenches. Maybe that brings it alive for you just a little bit. The important section is America joins the war. Well, hey, welcome to the party, America. It's only been going on for two and a half years so far. So nice of you to finally join us. What took America so long to join the war? What do you think? A cause. We just got out of the war. We just got out of the war. Okay. We're dealing with the uh, Spanish-American War a little bit. We don't want to get into the war. What type of an attitude, JR? Say it again. We don't want to get into war. We don't want to get into war. What's that attitude called? Neutrality. Neutrality and isolationist. Very good. Most of America is isolationist. Remember, George Washington said... Be very careful about getting involved in foreign entanglements, which means stay neutral, right? So we have followed George Washington's advice pretty well. There's been a couple, right? Spanish-American, Mexican-American, whatever. But by and large, we have followed George Washington's advice about making sure America comes first. Well, not just the president, but also the American public is very isolated. What was Mexico's role in the war? Thing now. Well, in the end, Mexico does not get involved. But Germany tries to get Mexico to invade America from the south. And they send this coded message, and it's all numbers. I'm going to, JR, what would you do? I mean, like, I would declare war, but I would think Boston would do. Oh. It just came out of the war. His whole political campaign was about keeping peace. His campaign promise was that I didn't get involved in the war, and I'm going to stay out of the war. That's a great thought, JR. Here's what Wilson says. He says the world must be made safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted on tested foundations of political liberty. He's going the democracy route. We're going to get involved in this war because we've got to protect democracy at home and abroad. This is Wilson asking Congress for a declaration of war. And Congress officially declares war on Germany in April of 1917. If you look at the date, you see that the war has been going on for two and a half years. America is really late to this party, but America getting involved is going to finally bring the war to a conclusion. There's a newspaper heading, the nation is now at war. So America uh, mobilizes for war. We don't have an army that's quite ready to go. It's not big enough. We don't have enough equipment. So we have to have a draft to build our army. There's a draft card. Remember the draft is mandatory military service. You get drafted into the army. Look at the lower left-hand corner. What do you see on this draft card? Just describe. You can't read the words. Just describe what you see. What's that? Little, no, left-hand side. Lower left-hand side. Look, little cutoff, little triangle cutoff. Let me pull it up bigger for you. It says, if person is of African descent, cut off this corner. Why would the draft card say that? Person is an African descent. Oh, because of the Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws, okay. So if they cut off the corner of the draft card, what would it help them do? They would know if it was African. Okay, African or white. And what's the S word for that? Segregation. Segregation. The military is still unfortunately segregated. So you're going to have white units and black units. And it just goes to show you that unfortunately, it's really sad, part of our country's history. Unfortunately, there was still segregation to this level that, you know, this corner of this draft card was supposed to be removed for applicants. Water fountains, restaurants, movie theaters, buses, 
there's not even there's not even integration in the military yet, so they still have to go. But it's just the three people. But they is. still have to go, but you're fighting your own unit. Is that what you're about to say? So it's going to be separate today. No, 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 absolutely not today. Very fortunately, good things finally came about in our country. But I'm just showing you a sad part of our country's history. Even as recent as 1914, Africans and people of color were experiencing this type of discrimination. So I'm sharing with you your country's history so that if you see this ever happen again in the, in the current, you won't stand for it. If you ever see a corner that says tear this off, if you are fill in the blank, don't stand for it. We've already come past that. Let's not go back to it. Okay, remember all the battles? Remember I said that there was a second battle of the Marne? There was a second battle of the Marne. It was an allied victory. And from this second battle of the Marne, this is not on your notes. I'm bringing you a little Georgia history. The 3rd Infantry Division, which is out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. Okay, so your homegrown division. This is the unit I was in when I was in Georgia and I met my wife and Big reason that we came back here today as it is, right? Third Infantry Division gets known as the Rock of the Marne because they held their position like a rock. Like Jackson's men stood like stone walls. Stonewall Jackson. That's how nicknames happen, right? So Rock of the Marne, third ID, happens from the second battle of the Marne after America enters the war. Let's bring the war to a close. What do you say? Wilson gets involved in the war because he thinks that he can bring us to world peace. You remember, what was one of the nicknames for this war? The war to, say it louder, the war to end all wars. We really thought that this was gonna be the last war in all of human history. Now, ha ha, it wasn't, we know that now. But Wilson thought, I got a chance to bring the world to world peace. And I got 14 ways to do it. I got 14 points to bring out world peace. November 11th is Veterans oh, Day. Oh, oh. Veterans oh, Day. No, no. So Veterans Day is related to the end of World War One. We're not going to watch this video right now, but this is an awesome little primary source footage of when the guns go silent. Guys, they shot at each other up until that 11th hour. It's like they all had their stopwatches out. And they're like, hey, 1059, one more minute. Bang, bang, bang. And then at 11 o'clock, Goes in silence. For how long? And this forever. Before, and so at first it was a laying down of the arms. And if they didn't sort out a peace treaty, theoretically they could have started the war again. But in the end, they laid down their arms and you know the arms stayed laid down. All right, here's my acronym. I wonder if any of you have ever been called a brat. Anyone ever been called a brat? Or maybe you eat a bratwurst. B R A T. Here's what it stands for. B. Germany accepts blame for the war. Where are we supposed to fit this? Or there's space. Or the whole backside. Or you got those notes to the bottom. Or Germany is forced to pay reparations to the Allies. That's financial. Maybe you want to put a dollar sign next to that. A, Germany has a limited army, less than 100,000 troops. T, Germany loses territory. Blame, reparations, limited army, loses territory. Blame, reparations, limited army, loses territory. Last thought, last slide, we'll take a little brain break and play some flashcards. Big summary, the lasting effects of the war. Political, social, and economic. There's effects in all three of these areas. The U.S. emerges as a world power. We have arrived, we're on the world stage, we won the war. The U.S. has arrived as a world power. Germany is crushed by the treaty. The German spirit is deflated, they're crying. Very high casualty rate, civilian casualties 8 million, military casualties 10 million. I need to correct one thing I said yesterday. I think yesterday I said 40 million dead. I should have said 40 million casualties, which means dead and injured. 18 million dead, 40 million altogether casualties. So still a huge worldwide impact. How many in the Civil War? Starts with a six. 620. Thousand, right? Well, now we're talking 40 million casualties, 18 million dead. Big war. Uh, what else? And then 300 billion dollars in those dollars, 4.3 trillion dollars, trillion with a T, if you were to adjust that for today. So big worldwide impact. Human ingenuity was on the rise because of the war. So take a look at this picture. 
he, this young man had his nose blown off, his nose was part of his mouth, but uh, the prosthetic, uh, medical advances in prosthetics, arms, legs, facial features, allows him to live a normal life. So pretty cool that human war is bad, but sometimes innovation comes out of war, and when it's able to help people like that, it's a good thing. The role of women was increased, right? When men went to the battlefield, women went to the factories, Women went to the farm. We are about to see women allowed to do what? Vote. Vote. We're about to see women get the right to vote. And it starts with women proving themselves in the war. It should have happened a lot earlier, right? I'll be the first to say that. But because of World War One, we're going to see women get the right to vote. We'll talk about that later this week. If you're, let me finish. If you're ever interested in really seeing a cool uh, museum, Kansas City, Kansas is home to the World, National World War I Museum and Memorial. The memorial itself is this large stone pillar. It's called an obelisk, but the museum is awesome. When I uh, taught cadets in Oklahoma, I was able to go visit it, and these are my first students. Uh, I taught them how to do Army. 